Welcome, everyone. Our current environmental crises are unprecedented in terms of their scale, their complexity, and threats to human welfare. And the technological advances required to enable the energy transition are profound. Fundamental scientific discoveries are essential for solving these problems and charting a path to a sustainable future. We're fortunate today to have four faculty from the Weiss School of Natural Sciences here with us to discuss how their research and their disciplines in general can help us to address the central challenges faced by our communities related to climate change, biodiversity loss, and the development of sustainable energy systems. They represent the foundation of outstanding talent at Rice in these areas, which we are growing in the Weiss School through our new Earth, Environment, Ecosystem, and Energy Initiative, which will bring together multidisciplinary teams to partner across Rice and with industry, government, and NGOs to tackle these challenges. It will guide growth of faculty, administrative support for ad academic programs like the environmental sciences major, and physical infrastructure for environmental research. It will allow the sciences to support and interface with the emerging university environment and sustainability institute. Our first speaker for today is Adrienne Correa. She's a marine biologist and an assistant professor of biosciences. Her primary research interests include the diversity and evolutionary histories of marine microorganisms and the influence of microbes on ecosystem function and persistence, with a focus on coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. This year, she was awarded an NSF Career Award for her work on coral predators. Please welcome Adrian Correa. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so um, my name's Adrian Correa, and I am excited to be here with you today to share uh, some of my lab's work in microbial ecology and how it's been able to inform um, some management of our backyard Texas reef. But first, let's talk about um, these billboards from UT Health, which are a familiar site around Houston. Um, in this one, we see that Dr. Boerwinkel is identifying genes linked to Alzheimer's. And you know, these billboards are celebrating basic biology discoveries about how the body works because they are critical to the development of medicine. And the same thing goes for environmental health. If we want to be able to mitigate the effects of floods or climate change or biodiversity loss, we have to understand how ecosystems stru are structured and function. And members of Biosciences at Rice are making great strides in this area. So I'm a global change microbial ecologist, and my group integrates across a variety of approaches to try to understand the microbial contributions to reef ecosystems. And this work matters because the oceans and humankind impact each other. So the oceans um, provide a variety of services to humans that support our health, our wealth, and our well-being. And so maintaining the health of the oceans is really important to us. Um, and it also goes the other way where humans are impacting the ocean, but typically in an adverse sort of way. So this argues that we really need to move towards a more sustainable way of interacting with the ocean. And I want to talk in particular about people and our interactions and our interdependence with coral reefs because so many people and societies depend on reefs. Um, so uh -oh, hopefully this, yes, okay. So this is the, the coral reef in cross section here and that's a physical three-dimensional structure that, um, that grows in the ocean. They're made by living coral animals and these microorganisms that live on and in their tissues. And these, these large reef frameworks play really a crucial role to coastal cities because wave energy from the ocean breaks on the reef and, um, and that keeps it from eroding the shoreline. And it also helps prevent flooding. Um, and so that's an important service. Additionally, um, many society, many people that live on islands are actually living on old coral framework itself, and they're subsisting on reef fisheries. And additionally, um, for others living near reefs, there's about 36 billion annually in tourism that people derive from um, visiting reefs. And then, you know, reefs support, there are a quarter of the known uh, species in the ocean are found on reefs. And that includes um, 
supporting, supporting fisheries organisms that we use. And so basically, you know, a healthy reef has a lot of living corals. But unfortunately, reefs are degrading, are being degraded rapidly. We've, um, about 75% of reefs are currently threatened. And in the le since the 1950s, reefs have, have lost half of their ability to provide us with these great ecosystem services. We've lost half of the living coral cover since then, and our catch per unit effort with fisheries has declined significantly as well. And all of this, when you lose this living coral, you lose all of these ecosystem services. You lose um, erosion protection, you start having increased damages from floods, and you also lose tourism. And you can have climate refugees. So this is a really big problem. And when we think about the loss of these ecosystem services, it all comes back to the loss of, of living coral. And really what a coral is, you know, I've told you it's an animal, and some of them look like this, but inside, you know, a really fundamental part of what a coral colony is, is that it's a partnership with microorganisms. So millions and millions of microorganisms live in this coral animal tissue, and this is a beneficial, mutually beneficial partnership that they, that they rely on. So, for example, these microorganisms called Symbiodiniaceae are giving food to the coral animal, and then the coral animal is giving back in return nutrients and shelter. And so, um, you know, this partnership is part of why coral reefs are so large and so successful in the ocean, but there are also inherent risks to relying on another organism so much. And so what can happen is when environmental conditions um, change, such as when the oceans start warming due to climate change, you can have this partnership breakup. And so maybe you've heard of coral bleaching, um, which you can see happening here in this cross section through a coral branch. These are the living polyps on the outside and the Symbiodiniaceae have left when it got too hot. And here's, you know, here was a healthy reef, then this reef bleached, and here the coral animal is still alive, but those pigmented microorganisms have left. And so you can see the calcium carbonate that the coral animal deposits through the living transparent coral tissue. So either what can happen now is it can, um, this coral can, the corals can get their microorganisms back and hopefully survive. But sometimes what happens is uh, conditions don't revert to an appropriate levels fast enough and the corals can die or they can get overgrown by something else like what's happened here where kind of bushy or turf algaes have grown over dead coral frameworks. And the big problem is once you get here, once your corals have largely died, it's very difficult to return to a coral-dominated state where you're getting all of those ecosystem services from a reef. <clears throat> so this is, that's something we're really worried about in terms of marine science right now. And so part of what my, my lab group tries to do is understand how we can leverage microorganisms to reduce reef degradation and to bolster reef ecosystem resistance and resilience. I don't have time to tell you about some of our use-inspired research today, but for example, it's trying to get at this bleaching issue and this thermal tolerance issue. Um, so we can take Symbiodiniaceae, for example, and try to accelerate their adaptation to higher temperatures through selective breeding efforts. Um, and we can also look for uh, scalable delivery systems that can help us get microorganisms that might be probiotic in effect, out to reefs. Um, but what I do have time to tell you about today is some of the fundamental research efforts that we're doing in the lab that uh, we can use to try to support reef management. <clears throat> and where we're doing that is on our backyard coral reef, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which you can see here. This is a beautiful reef. It's one of the best kept, it's one of the, the healthiest reefs remaining in the wider Caribbean. It has about 55% live coral, that's most of what you're seeing here, and it's about 100 miles south of the Texas-Louisiana border, which you can see on this map. Um, and I was lucky to be able to be a research seat on their Sanctuary Advisory Council for about the last seven years. Um, and many of you may remember the tax day flood, which was in 2016. Uh, when the waters, the floodwaters receded, you could really see all the devastation that had been caused by that flooding event. Um, but where did that water go? It, when it left the land, it ran out into the ocean, into the gulf. And so here in brown is the land, but this swirling color, that's salinity or saltiness of the ocean um, in the water after that tax day flood. 
and these white colors are low salinity. And organisms in the ocean are not used to big changes in salinity. It can be very stressful or harmful. And that star is part of the flower garden banks. So um, those floodwaters were potentially interacting. <clears throat> and in 2016, August 2016, after the tax day flood, divers saw something really concerning out on the east bank. The waters were green. That's not normal. They saw this white mat growing on top of dead corals and sponges. The fish had moved away. Urchins were falling apart. And other organisms were trying to get on top of the corals, like they were trying to get away from something. Um, and so people were very concerned about what was causing this death in the area. And they thought, could it be that it's the floodwaters that have moved out there and are impacting the reef? Or could it be a brine seep, which is also in the area that's super salty water, or maybe some kind of leak or pollution <coughs> um, from something else? And this was particularly concerning because it became apparent that soon uh, Hurricane Harvey in 2017 was also going to be a major flooding event on the Texas coast. So um, my lab group was able to lead a, a group of researchers to go and conduct research trying to understand what had contributed to this mortality event and how major storms could potentially impact a reef, even if it was really remote and far from shore and theoretically far from human impacts. And what we found was that we were able to rule out some of the proposed causes of that 2016 mortality event um, and suggest uh, with a good degree of confidence what we think happened. And what, what, what we believe happened after the 2016 event was that a lens, a massive lens of flood water moved out all the way out to over the flower garden banks and sat on top of the salt water. And that didn't allow oxygen to mix down into the water column. And then at the east bank at the same time, upwelling happened to occur locally and brought nutrient-rich waters up onto parts of the banks. And that spelled disaster because it resulted in a bloom of um, small plankton, which then died, and then bacteria ate those plankton, drawing down oxygen as they respired, causing low dissolved oxygen, which killed all those different organisms on the bank. <clears throat> Um, so that was very important to, to people, to users of the reef, and also to managers to understand what was happening out of the banks. Um, and another thing that was found, Dr. Amanda Shore, who was a um, Rice Academy postdoctoral fellows, unfortunately is hidden under there. She also found when we sampled uh, sponges out at the reef that when she sampled sponges immediately following both of those massive flooding events, um, she found human associated, human waste associated bacteria. So E. coli and Klebsiella were in those organisms 100 miles offshore, 75 feet down in the water. And so the fact that these organisms were being contaminated by human waste microorganisms, um, but that you would not typically see these in a year that didn't have flooding was very concerning and opened our eyes to the fact that these reefs that we thought were too remote and too hidden away from, from humans that they could be affected by human events as well, um, by strong storms as well. And so this provides a strong argument, um, additional argument, for why we need to make sure our stormwater and our wastewater management systems are equipped to deal with uh, large-scale storms. And it also provides arguments for um, increasing green infrastructure in the city to deal with um, these types of events. So that was, um, that's what we've been able to do related to flooding. And fortunately, there hasn't been another uh, flooding event yet. Um, but there is another thing going on at the flower garden banks now, which is a disease outbreak that's been happening since the summer of 2022. And there's a lot of concern that this disease outbreak may be stony coral tissue loss disease or skittled. Um, skittled has been decimating much of the Caribbean since 2014. It infects 22 of 45 coral species. Um, and it's been hypothesized that there's a virus that infects the coral symbiont, the coral microorganism, and that that's, what is, that's part of what's driving the disease. And in fact, Alex Beglia within my lab group um, from corals infected with skittled in the Virgin Islands, also using genomic techniques, also found ev evidence of a virus infecting the symbionts. So, you know, in terms of 
relaying this and interacting with FGB and MS management about it. Um, as a member of the advisory council in 2019, I was able to tell them about Skittled uh, and, and that this was a concern based on work in the Virgin Islands. And soon after that, they released a Skittled preparedness um, and response plan for the flower garden banks. And unfortunately, in August 2022, when this disease outbreak began occurring, um, you know, although some sort of disease is out there, we are ready to, um, to work and try to see what it might be and to de determine whether the disease signs are consistent with Skittled or whether they might be some other type of coral disease. And that's particularly important because the Skittled response plan involves applying antibiotics to coral colonies to treat disease lesions when possible. Um, but for other diseases, if it's some other type of disease syndrome, then it would not, the cost benefit to doing that would not be um, sufficient to do it. So, uh, so we're able to, uh, my group is, is leading a team um, this March and also six months from now to go out and look at what's happening with this disease outbreak and try to determine what disease signs are present um, so that we can engage with the flower garden banks about it. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we'll have good news and it will not be skittled. But if there's anything that I'm hoping you'll take away from this, it's that fundamental research in ecology and evolutionary biology is important to environmental health and to human society. That microorganisms can help us understand global change impacts and that we can leverage them to increase resistance and resilience of ecosystems. And we have this really amazing reef in our backyard and very few people know about it. Let's protect it. So with that, I want to thank my lab group and all my collaborators um, and funding sources. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Raul Hernandez Sanchez. He's a Norman Hackerman Welch Young Investigator and Assistant Professor of Chemistry. His research combines supermolecular, organic, inorganic, and materials chemistry to synthesize functional systems that bridge the gap between nanoscale materials and molecular chemistry, including the design of compounds for the removal of toxic chemicals from our environment. In 2020, he received an NSF Career Award for his work on molecular nanotubes. Please welcome Raul Hernandez Sanchez. Thank you, Tom. I came to this room literally running. I was in Duncan Hall, but in the School of Music, and I knew about it 15 minutes before starting. So first thing I asked was for a cup of water. I'm still thirsty. And this was not on purpose because I'm going to tell you about water and the importance of it. So let me first get this out of the way. Um, I don't think I need to see myself. Um, so is the water we drink clean? That's uh, the essence and the question that I want you to take home, think about it, because this is the single one item that, that links everybody in this room, in this country, in this continent, in this planet. Because when I think about home, I think about this. Right? This is your home. Whatever you do in the other side of the world, it's happening here and vice versa. And we see it now in more problems associated with diseases. And what I'm going to tell you about is the problem that we know, uh, at least for the past two decades, uh, happening on water. Now, in the chemistry department, we're doing uh, our uh, small piece to take care of, of, of this issue. And that small piece is we're looking into, at least the shower lab is looking into degradation of PET, right? PET now can be manufactured in a location in the world, but it's found everywhere, as we sort of indirectly saw from Adrian's talk. Um, the West Group is working on catalytic systems based on, on earth abundant metals to move away from, from heavy uh, and uh, novel metals. We have theoretical work by the Kolomeisky Group working on understanding catalytic, catalytic processes. Um, uh, to, to better design uh, new systems. The Renata Lab looking at sustainable synthesis of amino acids, valuable amino acids. And the work I'm going to tell you about, it's on PFAS. So if you haven't heard about PFAS, I'm going to tell you everything you know 
in the next eight minutes. There's two groups of people in the chemistry department. We have those working on degradation, the two are in the Uregas group, and myself working on, on capturing them. So PFAS are fluorinated chemicals that, generally speaking, have a fluorinated system and an anionic head. Uh, therefore, that, uh, or that, that is what makes them go into water, the anionic head. Um, in the news, you may find, and I ask uh, a freshman undergraduate in my, in my group to put together this list, because I thought, if I put it together, I'm going to focus maybe or bias it on certain aspects. She did it. She provided me this list of, of news from no more than uh, two months ago, right? And all of them have to do with either a contaminated water or have to do with PFAS in the items that we use in every day, or it has to do with things that we eat, uh, or it has to do with the finding of uh, PFAS in locations as remote as the Arctic, 30 feet down in the ice. Right? You wouldn't think of that, right? Especially for these type of chemicals that have been manufactured for no more than 50 years. Well, uh, they're there. Um, in the body, you can see the list. I'm not, I'm not going to read it, but it's a, a very extensive list affecting the human body. It is particularly uh, um, detrimental to pregnancy, uh, leading to potentially miscarriages. Um, one of the problems is its residency time. It has a half-life of anywhere from four to eight years, right? Um, and it has, or it resides in our bodies. Uh, the latest study says that 99% of Americans have measurable levels in their blood. So right now, we're not even 100, I think, maybe, maybe close to 100. So one person here, statistically speaking, doesn't have. Everybody else? Well, you can't escape it. Simply, you cannot. Um, how do we ingest it? Well, I just told you, right, when I got here, I was drinking this cup of water. Um, and if you look at this map put together by the Environmental Working Group, uh, the latest update from June 8th, uh, 2022, you can see every dot in blue, it's a community, a location, a city, where if you go to your to your kitchen, open the tap water, and get yourself a cup of water, um, you're going to find yourself with a significant or measurable level of PFAS in that water. So, um, and I don't think this is extensive, right? Um, why? Because there, there needs to be more manpower for testing, and, and, and there simply isn't, right? Um, so this is just a qualitative picture um, is not the extensive picture uh, of, the, of the problem. One week ago, the EPA established, finally, a, uh, this is a maximum contamination limit for these two PFAS. Both of these are the eight carbon uh, chain PFAS. Um, these are the ones that were manufactured uh, first. Uh, this is uh, early in the 50s, and I'm going to show you more or less when. Um, their limit is now 4 PPT, again, as of last week, right? How, what has been done? Nothing, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's just last week. Um, there's two numbers I want you to, to remember uh, from, from this map. One, there's about 200 million Americans impacted by, the, by this problem uh, right now. And September 3rd, 2024, that is the date when the EPA will be finalizing the new drinking standards. Um, so that date will impact industry, will impact how we uh, think about um, uh, protocols for, for measuring, for testing, you, uh, water utility uh, systems, everything, right? At least in the US. Um, as you can see, the number, I'm just talking about a few of them, right? This is just two of them. Um, there's a, a large number of them known, at least with the structure known, um, that, that, that the EPA has, has uh, make, made a list of. Um, anyhow, so uh, how can we, or how do we understand this problem? Everybody here uh, is most likely uh, related to Teflon and, and, and how we use it 
uh, right? Teflon, you find it in, in cookware, right? So essentially, Teflon is a polymer. Well, now think of chopping that polymer into small, well-defined pieces. You have molecules. Now, if these molecules have this anionic head, then they have the potential of going into water, right? So um, somewhere here um, in, the, in the 50s, in uh, this decade, um, these molecules were developed, and you will perhaps have seen it in movies. Uh, if you've been close to, a, to a, a, a heavy fire, maybe you've saw it, this, this foamy material. That foaminess comes from PFAS in that water. It is used to put out heavy fires, right? So now think about it, right? If we're putting out heavy fires, clearly fire or a strong heat source is not making anything to the PFAS, right? I mean, that's one of the design features of these molecules. Um, so, and it's been used since the 50s until about the 2000s. Uh, more recently, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, you find it everywhere, right? I, I most likely, uh, this shirt has it, my jeans, my shoes, this carpet, uh, this container. Um, it's essentially everywhere. Um, in the 2001, the U.S. stopped manufacturing uh, at least these two particular uh, compounds, which are the most uh, health problematic. Um, but if, if I show you a, a map of a, of a recent study on, on daily items, uh, I'm sorry you cannot see it from, from far, but you have here, for example, ice chocolate cake, 17,000 PPT, right? Clearly way above the limit delineated by the EPA. Um, and well, the other items are in the hundreds, uh, maybe tens, uh, but still, right? It's a big problem. Um, scientifically speaking, if we look into this chart put together by one of the leading groups uh, in, in, in PFAS capture, uh, this is a group in Nor at, at Northwestern University, you can see that most of the standard technologies that we use fall into the middle third or the right-hand side third, where it's either unrealistic conditions or a highly contaminated site. What we care is on the, on the one on the left, which is the one where we have environmentally relevant concentrations. Groups have developed uh, materials to remove PFAS from water. These are three examples from three different groups in the states, removing PFAS from about the PPV level down to the tens of PPTs, parts per trillion. Our work centers on PFAS at environmentally relevant concentrations. Uh, we are a chemist designing recognition sites, and so what we've done is essentially design a recognition site selective for anion sequestration, specifically for the two anions that I told you about, because we want to develop this into a membrane where, that we can use for filtering water. Um, we polymerize it in a, in a, in a particular way uh, to create this type of membranes, where essentially, once we pass water through this membrane, the PFAS stays in these uh, greenish baskets. How does it work? Well, we, we have uh, good results indicating that in less than two hours, we can get rid of of PFAS down to a point of, of a residual concentration of the previously advised limit by the EPA. If we expose it a little longer, we can get to the single digit PPT. So we're, we're getting there, right? Um, if we move into column mode experiments, which is the more realistic condition, just flowing water through a column, we can get reusability of up to uh, 40 mils uh, uh, per column. Now, what does that mean, right? Um, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you um, that we've improved that from, from 40 to 100 to an, our newest version of a polymer. Now, what does 100, mil, 100 milliliters mean in this condition? It means that if we extrapolate the amount of material in that column to a kilo, that is able to clean up about 5,000 liters of water or equivalent to a 12-month lifetime uh, relative to the traditional under sink filter, right? So that is the kind of impact that we're looking for, right? That we can actually 
translate this into uh, an item that, that we can use to clean up water locally. The next step is degradation, and I'll, I'll stop there because that's what my colleagues are working on, so I hope they can, they can at some point tell you about that work. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Cinti Lee. He's the Harry Carruthers Weiss Professor of Geology in the Department of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences, and also a Baker Institute Rice Faculty Scholar for the Center for Energy Studies, Energy, Materials, Minerals, and Materials Program. His primary expertise is in geochemistry, investigating how continents form, volcanoes evolve, and elements cycle through the planet. Sinti is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Geochemical Society of America, and the Mineralogical Society of America, and he's the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim and Packard Foundations. Please join me in welcoming Sinti. Okay, most people at Rice, outside of my department, probably only know me because of the birds, um, and I talk a lot about them. Uh, and the birds, of course, easier to talk about because they're, they're pretty. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what I really do for a living. And so I'm a geochemist, and I'm going to talk about strategic mineral intelligence. And probably well, every word, you know what it means, but the combination, you might wonder, what is that? So what, what is a strategic mineral? And let me start off with a, a story. This is from World War II. And... Um, what it's showing is the pathways of tungsten uh, during the war. And tungsten is a very he heavy element, almost as heavy as uh, gold. And when you alloy it with iron, you get this very hardened steel. So you can build uh, weapons, these bunker-busting weapons. So everybody uh, was interested in, in building um, these weapons with, with tungsten. And uh, it turns out, there were only two places in the world that had sufficient amount of tungsten. It was Portugal and uh, China. It turns out North Korea also, uh, but it wasn't really accessible at, uh, at that time. It still is not accessible. But um, the, uh, the, the Nazis were in need of uh, tungsten, and uh, the U.S. was, the Brits were, and the Portu Portugal was selling their tungsten to everybody. They didn't care. And uh, the Japanese also needed tungsten, and there was a recent discovery of tungsten in uh, southern China, which is today the largest, still the largest deposit of tungsten. The Japanese invaded southern China for the tungsten mine, uh, and they kept some of that tungsten for themselves, and they sold a lot of that tungsten uh, to the Nazis. And then the Americans came in, finally cut off that supply line, and all they had was Portuguese tungsten. Uh, but eventually, that got cut off uh, as well. So this is an example of a critical element, in this case, for war. Uh, we are seeing that uh, today in some sense as well. Um, but we got interested in this not for the history, but tungsten, the, the type of rocks that they're formed in, is in this compound, this calcium tungstenate, uh, an oxide of tungsten. And it forms when volcanic fluids, magmas, uh, fluids from volcanoes, migrate into limestones, former coral reefs, for example, that Adrian was, was talking about. That's that calcium carbonate, these fossils, and they react, and you get calcium tungstenate, and you pop out all the CO2, and that CO2 goes up, uh, contributes as a greenhouse gas, and we were very interested in uh, long-term climate change. So not the anthropogenic, but sort of like, why was it warm uh, greenhouse times during the time of the dinosaurs, which is here? And so we got uh, very interested in kind of mapping out where you find these things. And it uh, turns out where you find this, where the volcanoes intersect these ancient carbonate platforms. This is during the time of the dinosaurs. The continents were in a different configuration. Uh, it turned out with the tungsten deposits, because there was such a mad rush for tungsten in the U.S., um, everyone was out looking for them. And we had a great database of all these little pipes where tungsten was being formed. Um, and for us, we were calculating CO2 uh, outputs. So there was a bit of a basic research uh, uh, connection in, in there. So that's a critical uh, element. And 
as a geochemist, I, I think our role is becoming more and more important for um, the future now with this energy transition. And I just show you here, you know, uh, predictions of, of global population going to the future. We have no idea. We didn't know that COVID was going to hit us. So there are a lot of uncertainties in this. But we already, when I was, when I was a kid, we were 4 billion people. We're now we're 8 billion people. We're going to go to 10 billion probably by the time I'm dead. And at the same time, uh, a lot of people are going to, uh, different countries are going to rise in prosperity. So this is the happiness index versus your energy per capita use. And if everyone were to live like an American, see the big red dot right there, and grow in population, we have a serious problem. It's not just growth in population, it's just the amount of energy we consume because everyone wants to live like us. And you can't really tell them not to live like an American. They have every right to live like us. And so the problem, of course, is we want to transition to um, renewables at the same time because we know that our current energy platform is pretty much almost all fossil fuels and we know the impacts of that CO2 emissions and the impacts on climate. So there's pressure to, to move but this gives you what we're up against, right? You can see on these wedges how much is actually uh, in terms of renewables, uh, hydropower and then there's uh, uh, nuclear. And so we, we have to, we, we've gotten off of coal to some extent, oh, it's coming back, but we replaced it with natural gas. Well, we're going to have to replace all of the hydrocarbons, that's coal, natural gas, oil, plus more um, because of the population growth to make this energy transition. So it's really tough. And to do that, um, we have to trade one evil, which is oil, with other evils, and that's uh, all these metals, lithium, cobalt, rare earth elements, copper, copper to revamp the whole electrical grid, uh, lithium and cobalt for the batteries, rare earth elements for the, the magnets and the turbines to convert mechanical energy into electrical um, energy, right? And those, to some extent, are uh, scarcer than oil or hydrocarbons. And I, I made this calculation here, which is how much time do we have left with our current uh, reserves? Like how much, we, we know how much we have in the ground that we can um, take out uh, in a cost-efficient uh, way. And so uh, if you look at the, green, the, the red line, that would be how much time the, the whole planet, our 8 billion people in the world, has for each of these elements. Phosphorus is for fertilizers, right? Um, if everyone was to live like an American, and this is not even talking about doing a full conversion to... Uh, getting off of oil. So this is just living like an American, and if we shared everything, well, it's not that bad. You know, lithium, you have 100 years. So okay, if you shared everything. Um, but if you took the United States and said, let's close our borders, and we only rely on our own materials. We don't rely on, you know, there's a lot of geopolitics going on. This is what we've got. You've got 10 years for lithium. you got nickel. We've got a big problem with nickel. Most of the world's nickel comes from South Africa or Russia, actually. So it's not looking good. What this is telling you is these, these resources are not distributed equally um, around uh, the world. And so that's kind of what I do, is to try to figure out how uh, uh, these resources are distributed, how you form them. And most of the elements that we're interested in are really in low concentrations, and it's all because of the way of nucleosynthesis in the stars. We inherit what the stars give us. As you take something like copper, your average copper concentration is 30 parts per million. It's, you would not mind that. That's not worth your time. So you want nature, geological processes, to pre-concentrate it to a few weight percent. Then you can go. And then ultimately you refine it to 100%. But nature, what it's got to do is mobilize and scavenge from an enormous area, focus it into a tiny little spot, store it, capture it, so that you can eventually uh, mine it. And so that's an ore deposit. And they're not equal around the world, and that's what we search for. And so this is an artwork from Dylan Marsh. This is what we have to deal with. This is a copper mine, and all of that rock mined out gave you that much of, of copper, okay? Um, and that's, uh, that was already enriched. So there's the, the damage from mining is, is just as bad as from oil. So Earth is really a chemical refinery, and the stars really have to align to get to an ore deposit. I don't have time to get into great detail, but you know, we have plate tectonics, the planet is dynamic, there's interactions between the atmosphere, the interior of the Earth, uh, climate, life, 
all that, all those come together, changing redox states, moving elements around. Uh, there's heat, and basically it's a refinery. We have in the volcanic system, and it starts very deep, finally all the way to the surface, sometimes all the way to eruption, and we basically track where these metals are going in all of these uh, places. And so I'll give you a few examples. I don't have time to get into great detail, but this, this is showing you distribution of copper porphyries, which are the dominant source of copper for our planet. And it looks like the U U.S. is pretty good at that, but Africa has none. Um, the eastern part of South America pretty much has none, and Russia doesn't have very much uh, there. And so, you know, if people need it, uh, they're going to have to share or, or trade the copper around. And why is it that copper only occurs in certain places of the world? It's, again, all due to the stars having to align, uh, controlled by geology. And what we do is we, we look at the chemistry, we look at the physics of fluid transport, we, we, um, and, and how those all interact to uh, ultimately from down deep to, to where we get to the end. So in this particular case, uh, one of the end products, this, this is an ore deposit. It doesn't look like there's much copper in there but it's enough to mine, but it has these big crystals, and we're very interested in the kinetics of how these crystals grow, so my group has focused a lot on that now, because that tells you about the process by which this, this magma is in place, what pressures, how fast it's placed, how fast it cools, and how fast the fluids come out, and that's what dictates um, when and where the, the metals, like copter, are going to come out, and then we know where to go to look for them. Another one is lithium. Again, this is a map uh, that we did of where lithium deposits are found around the world. Again, not equal, and why? So, um, again, related a lot to geology, and I won't go into details, but I'll just show you on this plot uh, on the left by uh, work by an another group, which is a choke point. The, uh, you go from left to right uh, of the path of lithium, and you see the dominant producer of lithium are Chile and Australia. Um, the United States doesn't have that much. We have it, we just can't get it out of the ground right now yet. Um, China doesn't have that much, but all the raw products eventually, you can see, go through China as the refining, and then it gets redistributed around the world, right? So uh, in terms of geopolitics, the U.S. Uh, needs to find more lithium deposits on its own ground or perhaps in Canada. So that's some of the stuff we're focused on. And finally, at the end, the other thing we've moved into is rare earth elements. Uh, Sydney Allen is uh, working with the USGS now in a collaboration. We're out, we'll go next uh, two weeks from now to do some mapping out there. And this, this plot right here shows you that back in the 80s, the biggest rare earth element deposit in the world being mined was the United States. And then uh, the Chinese took over, and we have been shrinking in our wedge. And we need to bring that back up by remobilizing this mine or discovering new uh, uh, deposits. Um, but we also have to worry about the environmental damage that, that comes with this. And so I end with that. Um, so when I say strategic elements and then intelligence is really about predicting where we're going to find these in the future and then understanding the, the whole supply chain, the geopolitics and the environmental consequences. Um, as you know, I'm a big believer in conservation and I'm not about to just go pillage the earth if we don't have a way to um, take care of it. Uh, so I'll end with that. Um, th those are my birds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Cinti. So our final speaker from today is Mark Torres. He's an assistant professor of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences. He studies the biological, chemical, and geological processes that distribute elements across our planet's surface and interior especially those that regulate Earth's habitability, like water, carbon, and oxygen across a range of surface environments. He is a recipient of a Sloan Fellowship and the F.W. Clark Medal in Geochemistry. Please welcome Mark Torres. Thank you very much. So um, I'm interested in what makes and keeps planets habitable. Uh, admittedly, I take a very Earth-centric perspective but I think it's justified because Earth's the only planet we know that has any life. Um, on Earth, the presence of life is very much tied to liquid water, which in turn is tied to the greenhouse effect caused by CO2 gas. So primarily what I study is the carbon cycle, and that's what I'm going to talk to today. And it turns out that's useful not only for trying to think about the habitability of exoplanets, but also back here at home. We are profoundly perturbing the carbon cycle 
And so we might want to look at what lessons we can learn from sort of the natural behavior of the carbon cycle that both inform what the consequences of our actions might be, but also potentially point to some solutions. So with that, let will sort of start with what is the carbon cycle, or what do I mean? So uh, the Earth constantly emits CO2, it accumulates in the atmosphere, and it would just build up if there weren't some way for that carbon to naturally be removed. And this occurs because uh, in the atmosphere and the ocean, that carbon is converted to solid phases, particularly solid phase organic carbon, so dead bits of once living organisms, and solid phase inorganic carbon. This is calcium carbonate, for example, this coral reef, or one similar that uh, Adrian showed. So we are destabilizing the system. We are adding extra CO2 emissions, so we're no longer in balance, and we're accumulating CO2. And a basic question we might ask is, uh, how will we regain this balance, and, and when might that occur? And so to do that, I'm going to talk about one kind of angle, specifically just zooming in on this inorganic carbon cycle side. Partly for time, but somewhat justified because we think it's about 70 to 80 percent of total carbon burial uh, from the surface today. So it's going to get the majority anyways. So the way this works is that uh, volcanoes, and also us, remit CO2 gas that dissolves into water, forming a weak acid, carbonic acid. And then coral reefs are able to take that carbonic acid and convert it into um, their calcium carbonate. So this reaction here. And if you just look at that, you might notice right away there's an imbalance, right? Where is this calcium coming from that allows corals to sequester that carbon? This comes from another chemical reaction, and it's one that my group and I study, called silicate weathering. So these rocks here have this mineral, this calcium silicate in them, and it reacts at the Earth's surface to liberate that calcium. It goes into water, flows into the ocean, where a coral reef can use it to make their skeletons. And so this reaction ends up being the rate-limiting step to sequestering carbon naturally from Earth's surface. And we've known about this for quite a while. So the French scientist Jacques Ebelman in 1845 wrote uh, in the English translation, uh, I see in volcanic phenomena the principal cause that restores carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that is removed by the decomposition of rocks. Since 1845, we've studied this a lot. We've made lots of measurements of this process and built really complicated but accurate models of how this works, and I'll show you the results of one such model. So uh, this is an experiment where we take a sort of digital Earth that has all of the carbon cycle in it, and what we're going to do, or what these authors did, is admit 15,000 gigatons of carbon about all at once. And just for those keeping track, that's about all of the known carbon reserves in fossil fuels. So if we were just to do everything with no limits, what would happen? And what they're doing is in time on the X, keeping track of atmospheric CO2 levels on the Y in the top panel and temperature change on the Y in the bottom panel. And you can see temperature and CO2 both go up, but there's a fairly rapid drop off very quickly. And that it occurs because that CO2 dissolves into the ocean and starts to dissolve living creatures. And so though it's great that there's a really fast drop, it's at a profound consequence to ecosystems. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of different curves on this, and, and there are some kind of differences between those two curves. So in this purple one, what's going on is that this silicate weathering reaction I'm talking about doesn't change. It stays constant. And in this orange one, that silicate, reaction, uh, silicate weathering reaction responds to climate. So higher temperatures mean faster reaction, and that's just theoretically true, but also the work we've been doing empirically shows that to be the case. And that's really good because that's the only way to actually recover back to original temperatures. So this reaction is absolutely critical for the Earth to naturally deal with carbon emissions. But what you'll notice is this took about a million years to happen. So certainly too slow to matter to any of us. And even if you admit less, like realistic amounts we might do, it never takes faster than a million years naturally. But this kind of points up an interesting question, right? If I understand the chemistry of this reaction, which is something I do, and here's some Rice students in the field collecting water samples to kind of measure this reaction in nature, if we really understand what's going on, well, maybe we could make it go faster. And this has actually been the focus of uh, uh, the field for quite a while, is to see what we could change to make it happen, you know, carbon to be sequestered using natural mechanisms and hopefully faster than a million years. So it turns out one thing we figured out is that the mineral supply rate matters a lot. That's what's shown on the x-axis here, which is just what is the mass of silicate material 
put at Earth's surface per unit time. And you can see that it's, you know, uh, the calcium you get out increases with that mineral supply rate up into a point, in which case temperature starts mattering. So uh, high rates of mineral supply and high temperatures, you get the most calcium out. Uh, in nature, the mineral supply rate is set by plate tectonics, which is very slow. However, we have tractors, right? We're really good at mining and digging up rock, and we can artificially increase that mineral supply rate. And if we put that rock in hot places, we will get extra calcium out. And we can take this one step better. It turns out biota also make this faster. So this is work I did a while ago where we took this organic molecule that bacteria make, and it turns out if you add more of that organic molecule, shown in the x-axis here, the minerals dissolve at a faster rate. And so you get maybe another factor of five. And so if I add the rock where I have the right biota, the right temperature, the right climate, I'm gonna be able to get calcium out faster than I would otherwise expect. And so people have been working this, right? Here's a map of the rocks we would need to mine. Here's a map of all the shipping routes we would need to move that rocks to these places where we have the right climate conditions and the right biota to get this to go fast. And what we can work out is the tons of CO2 we'd sequester per ton of rock um, and factor in all of the inefficiencies we get from grinding, mining, and shipping that. And if you add that all up, you could say something like one to 20 gigatons of carbon per year we could sequester. And I'll compare that to the 280 gigatons we've already admitted. And to take a, a, just a, a clear stance, I don't think we can continue business as usual and just use geoengineering to solve the problem. Instead, what's useful, or this kind of technology is great for, is once we've stopped emitting, how do we get rid of all the CO2 we've already emitted and the deleterious consequences of that CO2? Now, I want to want to point one thing about this efficiency, and this is to make the point that natural sciences is really important. So this number, this sort of maximum efficiency, where does that come from? If I just look at the chemical reaction, take that one mole of mineral, I'll convert it to four moles of carbon, uh, that should be 1.25 tons of CO2 per rock. But none of these green bars are there. And it turns out that's because of the way the ocean works, right? This bicarbonate, if you put it into the ocean, it equilibrates with a bunch of other dissolved carbon species in the ocean, and those actually resist the original change. So you can never actually get this theoretical efficiency because of the way the ocean works. And we only know the ocean works that way because we've studied paleoclimate, trying to understand glacial and glacial cycles. And so if you actually want to be able to predict the efficiency correctly, it turns out natural sciences is the key. And there are ways to do this in such a way where the efficiency is dropped by half. So we really need to pay attention to the way the ocean works. And as another lesson of maybe pointing out why natural science is important, I kind of want to show you this study. So people are trying to do this. So here is an experiment in a palm plantation in Malaysia where they dumped 50 tons of basalt per hectare into soil. And they put it in one plantation, not the other, and tried to measure if there's a difference in the rate of CO2 uptake. So this is the time on the x. And in the Y is, well, how much CO2 was taken up, you know, tons of carbon per unit area. And what you'll notice is where they added the rock and where they didn't are exactly the same. So they were able, they not able to detect any amount of CO2 uptake in their experiment. Now, other experiments have detected it, right? It does work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But the point is that, you know, we might wonder, well, why didn't it work here? And I don't know, but I have an idea. I don't work in Malaysia. But I work in Puerto Rico, and uh, you can see here, it's sort of tropical in the same way, and you can kind of play a spot the grad student in that photo. And what we find is that um, the way that those previous work workers were trying to measure CO2 uptake was to look at river water and say I should measure the amount of carbon in that river water, and it should go up. But they only sampled at low river flow rates. And what we've measured in Puerto Rico, at low river flow rates, all of that water in that river is from groundwater and none of it is actually flowing through soils. And so they're deliberately sampling a time where none of the products, right, they're adding the rock to the soil, are gonna be in the river. You really have to sample at high flow. And this is probably true generally in the tropics. And it kind of points out that we need to really understand surface hydrology if we're gonna try to monitor and verify these application processes. So uh, with that, I'll say maybe we can use Earth's natural carbon cycle to sequester our past CO2 emissions once we've stopped emitting CO2. But if we want to do this efficiently, we need to know how ocean chemistry works, which is a natural science problem. And if we want to monitor whether it's working at all, 
It turns out we really need to know what surface hydrology is doing, which is another natural science problem. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Thanks.